we have an incredible opportunity to create entirely new sustainable industries, investing in nature as the true engine of our economy. The current global crisis has disrupted every aspect of our lives. But it has also presented us with an extraordinary opportunity, a chance to reset and accelerate efforts to improve the state of our world. Changing our current trajectory will require bold and imaginative action, together with determination and decisive leadership. In order to secure our future and to prosper, we need to evolve our economic model, putting people and planet at the heart of global value creation. If there is one critical lesson we have to learn from this crisis, we need to put nature at the heart of how we operate. We are on the verge of catalytic breakthroughs that will alter our view of what is possible and profitable within the framework of a sustainable future. We need nothing short of a paradigm shift, one that inspires action at revolutionary levels and pace. We simply cannot waste any more time. The only limit is our willingness to act. And the time to act is now. The yeses are coming in. All right, I'm going to read this. I don't want anybody to become scared by what I'm going to read, though. All right, because the reason I, I don't want to put out negative information, but I also want you to understand that we should always set our intention. Our intention should always be focused on positive and we should always prepare for the worst, but we should always expect the best, all right? Always prepare for the worst, but expect the best. So that's what I want you to keep in mind. Now, obviously, uh, there's a delay. In the, if you guys, let's see, I'm wondering what you guys are seeing. If you are seeing, all right, so you guys are actually seeing me. That's perfect. So you are not seeing that. You are seeing me. Perfect. So... I'm going to go ahead and read this, and I want you to understand why I'm reading it. I'm reading it so that we can all become prepared. I am not a violent, a person prone to violence. I do not like to engage in violence or in uh, aggressive activity, but many times people that encounter an individual like me who doesn't want to engage mistake my reluctance to engage with my inability to engage. And so I'm here to tell you that each one of you should be prepared to engage. That doesn't mean that we are expecting to engage, but we need to be prepared because what I'm going to read to you right now is not something that is, um, it doesn't give you the warm and fuzzies, okay? So first of all, to uh, Denise, Thank you for sharing this, Denise. And I love it when people send me messages and they come into the system. Um, she has our lifetime member number there. So I really appreciate that for uh, a lifetime member for uh, IADFW. Guys, by the way, if you are, this is one of the few times that I'm going to do something that I was going to just do for the IADFW. And I'm going to do it out for everybody else because this is really important information. But if this type of information and this type of connection is important to you, there's a lot of other really, really positive proactive things in the International Association for a Disease-Free World. And I would really encourage you to go down to askdrbitar.com um, forward slash ask that link right there and just go through it, fill in that information, join the Advanced Medicine Dashboard, get access to the head map. All this stuff is for free, but then consider seriously joining the International Association for a Disease-Free World. There's actually a little webinar that you can watch on demand when you go to this link. All right, when you go to that link, there's a little video it'll be down um maybe i don't know the eighth ninth tenth uh screen and it'll say the iadfw and if you watch that you'll understand why you should join and if you don't want to join that's great but uh, i think those that are freedom loving and believe in their own autonomy they're going to want to join all right so here's a message 
This was a leaked email from the Liberal Party of Canada that lays out the plan. Uh, it's LPC Strategic Committee leak in box PC leaker, okay? This occurred on October 10th, 2020. Dear, and then it's a blank, it's, uh, it's x dot because this was an email that was sent to somebody else to let them know because the person that wrote this email was present, was there, firsthand heard this. I want to provide you some very important information. I'm a committee member within the Liberal Party of Canada. I sit within several committee groups, but the information I'm providing is originating from the Strategic Planning Committee, which is steered by the PMO. I think the PMO is part... Is that the Prime Minister of Canada? I think PMO must be, um, I don't know what PMO is. Maybe, some, maybe somebody can tell me what PMO is. Can you look up what PMO is in the Canadian Liberal Party? Okay. I need to start off by saying that what I'm not happy, that I'm not happy doing this, but I have to. As a Canadian and more importantly, as a parent who wants a better future, not only for my children, but for other children as well. The other reason I am doing this is because roughly 30% of the committee members are not pleased with the direction this will take Canada. But our opinions have been ignored and they plan on moving forward toward their goals. They have also made it very clear that nothing will stop the planned outcomes. So 30% of the Liberal Party in Canada that was sitting on this committee did not want to go along with this. And yet the powers that be are saying that they don't have a choice. Uh... Wrong answer. We always have a choice, all right? In the United States, we, can, we are still, the Second Amendment is intact, and in Canada, I know there's enough people out there that still have their weapons, no matter what they've tried to orchestrate and take your weapons away. Guys, just remember, when, you're, when you are caring, when you have your own weapons, now suddenly you are no longer easy fodder, and they're going to think once, twice, three times before they ever try to cross horns with you, okay? Because they don't want to engage with people. They, if, if they don't have anything that they can lose, then they may. So this is why it's so important to be prepared and expect the best, but be prepared for the worst. So here's what it comes down to. The roadmap and aim was set out by the PMO and is as follows. And I hate looking down when I'm, when I'm reading this, so let me see if I can read it this way. All right. Phase in secondary lockdown restrictions on a rolling basis, starting with major metropolitan areas first and expanding outward. Expected by November 2020. Next one. Rush the acquisition off or construction off isolation facilities across every province and territory. Expected by December 2020. These are concentration camps they're talking about. Daily new cases of COVID-19 will surge beyond capacity of testing. Interesting that they already know that they're going to surge, right? Why? Because they know that it, the more, every, if there is such a virus out there, assuming that there's a real virus out there, the testing is already, going, it's already predetermined. They're testing, they're attenuating, they're basically amplifying the uh, RT-PCR test to the point that every human being will test positive. That's what their goal is. All right, so the new daily cases of covid Daily new cases of COVID will surge beyond capacity of testing, including increases in COVID-related deaths following the same growth curves expected by end of November 2020. Complete and total secondary lockdown, much stricter than the first and second rolling phase restrictions, expected by end of December 2020, early January 2021. Reform and expansion of the unemployment program to be transitioned into the universal basic income program, except expected by quarter 1, 2021. Projected COVID-19 mutation and or co-infection with secondary virus referred to as COVID-21 leading to a third wave with much higher mortality rate and higher rate of infection expected by February 2021. Daily new cases of COVID-21 hospitalizations and COVID-19 and COVID-21 related deaths will exceed medical facility capacities expected by quarter first uh, by Q1, Q2 of 221. Enhanced lockdown restrictions referred to as third lockdown will be implemented. Full travel restrictions will be imposed, including inter-province and inter-city, expected by quarter two, 2021. Guys, understand that. That means that if you're, if you're in British Columbia, you can't go to um, uh, Quebec, all right? This is what they're talking about. And if you're in one city and you're trying to go into another city in the same province, they're not going to try to, they're not going to allow you to do that. This is in Canada. Of course, they're going to try to roll this out, and I'll get to that point here in a second. All right. Uh, 
Transitioning of individuals into the Universal Basic Income Program, expected mid-quarter to 2021. Projected supply chain breakdowns in inventory storage, large economic instability, all expected late second quarter 2021. Deployment of military personnel into major metropolitan areas as well as all major roadways to establish travel checkpoints. Restrict travel and movement, provide logistical support to the area expected by third quarter 2021. Along with that provided roadmap, the Strategic Planning Committee was asked to design an effective way of transitioning Canadians to meet an unprecedented economic endeavor, one that would change the face of Canada and forever alter the lives of Canadians. All right, guys, this is where it gets really disturbing, as if it's not already disturbing. What we are told was that in order to offset what was essentially an economic collapse on an international scale, that the federal government was going to offer Canadians a total debt relief. So people are getting excited about that. That sounds good. But wait, this is how it works. The federal government will offer to eliminate all personal debts, all mortgages, all loans, all credit cards, etc., with all funding, which all funding will be provided to Canada by the IMF under what will become known as the World Debt Reset Program. In exchange for acceptance of this total debt forgiveness, the individual would forfeit ownership of any and all property and assets forever. In exchange for acceptance of this total debt forgiveness, the individual would forfeit ownership of any and all property and assets forever. The individual would also have to agree to partake in the COVID-19 and COVID-21 vaccination schedule which will provide the individual with unrestricted travel and unrestricted living even under a full lockdown. So if you agree, you can go do anything you're doing as long as you partake in the COVID-19 and COVID-21 vaccination schedule, regardless of the lockdown, magically you take this vaccine and boom, guess what? You don't have to social distance. You don't have to wear a mask anymore because you have already gotten your vaccines. All right. So this is unrestricted living under even under a full lockdown through the use of a photo identification referred to, uh, to as Canada's Health Pass. Committee members asked who would become the owner of the forfeited property and assets in that scenario and what would happen to, le- to lenders or financial institutions. We were simply told the World Debt Reset Program will handle all of the details. So when that was, they were asked what happens to the property and what happens to uh, the banks, don't worry about it, we're going to take care of it. That's what they were told. All right, and now it gets really, really interesting. Wow. Committee members asked who would become, I'm sorry, excuse me, I read that. Several committee members also questioned what would happen to individuals if they refused to participate in the World Debt Reset Program or the Health Pass or the vaccination schedule. The answer we got was very troubling. Essentially, we were told it was our duty to make sure we come up with a plan, meaning the Liberal Party was told that it was their duty to come up with a plan to ensure that would never happen. We were told it was was in the individual's best interest to participate. When several committee members pushed relentlessly to get an answer, we were told that those who refused would first live under the lockdown restrictions indefinitely, and that over a short period of time, as more Canadians transitioned into the debt forgiveness program, the ones who refused to participate would be deemed a public safety risk and would be relocated into isolation facilities. Once in those facilities, they would be given two options, participate in the debt forgiveness program and be released or stay indefinitely in the isolation facility under the classification of a serious public health risk and have all your assets seized. As you can imagine, after hearing all of this, it turned into quite the heated discussion and escalated beyond anything I've ever witnessed before. In the end, it was implied by the PMO that the whole agenda will move forward no matter who agrees with it or not. That it won't just be Canada, but in fact, all nations will have similar roadmaps and agendas. That we need to take advantage of the situations before before us to promote change on a grander scale for the betterment of everyone. The members who were opposed and ones who brought up key issues that would arise from such a thing were completely ignored. Our opinions and concerns were ignored. We were simply told to just do it. All I know is that I don't like it and I think it's going to 
place Canadians into a dark future. So guys, now you know why I was hesitating to release this information, but um, now you also understand why it's so critical. Now, 